God in heaven, I ask once again for wisdom and grace. I pray that I would be far removed from this situation so that it's not the pastor speaking, but it's you speaking. I pray that each of the hearers would be far removed from their situation so it's not them hearing, it's you hearing. Lord, Lord, take up residence in our hearts. Let this whole message be all about you. And I pray that it would elevate us from where we are to a higher plane, closer to you, more reflective of your character, more reflective of your sense of peace. Bless us in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Okay. Uncertain times. Well, friends, I've already mentioned the presidential election, uh, which was contested at least until this morning, and I kind of have a funny feeling it's not done being contested yet. But that has certainly been something that we've been living through throughout this past week. One of the major reasons why I personally feel like this week has been about eight years long. But that's certainly not the only sense of being uncertain right now. Of course, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. COVID-19 is still out there with all of its downstream consequences. Many of us are out of work and don't know when we're going to have a change in that paradigm. Uh, many schools are closed, although notably not our school in Chowchilla. We have a one through eight grade school, which hopefully will expand to be K through eight in the near future. So if you have a student in those age groups in Madera County and you are looking to not do virtual school anymore, it may be worthwhile to reach out to me and see if we have a place for you in our school. But most schools are still closed. And having had two young children at home every single day for seven months this year, I understand the stress that that can bring to a family. There are restrictions everywhere. Here in Madera County, we're sandwiched in between two other counties that are less restrictive than we are. So it kind of feels more restrictive here. Um, we still are not supposed to open our doors to the public. We still are not supposed to eat inside at a restaurant. We still are not supposed to do a whole lot of things. And even if you go north or south to a less restrictive area, there's still a lot of things you're not supposed to be doing. So this is a difficult time to be alive. And of course, in the backdrop of all of this is racial tensions, social unrest, and the like, you know? I don't think we're going to run out of reasons why these are uncertain times. And so we all recognize that we're living in strange days right now, but what to do about it? How do we react to it? And all you have to do is jump on Facebook and see how the world is reacting to it. And here's a hint in case you're not on Facebook, which I guess means you're watching on YouTube right now. But uh, <laughs> here's a hint. The world is not reacting very well to the level of uncertainty that 2020 has brought us. What do we do within the church? How do we behave in a different manner than the world around us, which seems to want to cut one another's throats and kind of burn down the whole planet? Everybody's angry and everybody's panicked right now. How does the church respond? Well, on the one hand, the answer is easy. I mean, inside of the paradigm of Christianity, what's always the answer? That's not a trick question, so I'm glad I heard at least one of the correct answer. Jesus is the right answer, right? Jesus is always the answer. And so, yes, we know the answer is Jesus. Flee to Jesus. Find refuge in Jesus. Find wisdom in Jesus. And here's some scriptures specifically to point us in the right direction of what that may look like. We'll start in Matthew 6, verses 31 through 34, the end of one of my favorite little sermonettes. Jesus says, therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? 
Or we can substitute any one of our own things, right? Do not worry saying who's going to win the election or when will it be safe to go back to a restaurant or when will everybody calm down, right? Do not worry about these things for after all of these things the Gentiles seek. But your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. I, li I like the NIV there. For tomorrow will worry about itself. <laughs> Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Um, I've mentioned this before, but here's a little pastoral insight here. The preacher is always preaching to himself. So I'm just as much an audience here as I am the preacher here. I'm a professional worrier by trade. So the Lord really spoke to my heart many years ago, the first time I really internalized this, and I am still internalizing it today. Do not worry. It will not add a single minute to your life. The Lord already knows everything you need. Seek him, and it's going to be okay. Hallelujah. Or John 16, verse 33, Jesus says, be of good cheer if the world is getting you down because I, meaning he, has overcome the world. It doesn't really matter if you wanted Joe Biden to be president or not. It doesn't matter if you're happy or sad because these are worldly things and the Lord has overcome the world. James 1.5 gives us the instruction that if we need wisdom, and which one of us does not need wisdom in these trying times, then let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach. Again, the NRV says, without finding fault in the asking, and it will be given to him. That means there's never a stupid question to ask God. He just wants to help you be wiser. Or Isaiah 26, verse 3, you, meaning God will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Corey Ten Boom was, I'm going to you know, foul this up because I don't have the quote right in front of me, but she says something to, to the effect of when you look at the world, it'll wear you down. When you look at Christ, he'll give you peace. She said it much more poetically than I just did, but that's the gist of what she's getting at. When the world wants to mess you up, the Lord wants to calm you down and keep you in perfect peace. And of course, Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. So if Mr. Biden really does become the next president, then all of your preconceived notions, good or bad, about what that means are completely irrelevant because we acknowledge the Lord and not our own understanding. And then he will direct our paths forward. So all of this is great, and I imagine it's not exactly new news. I mean, is there anybody who has not read these scriptures before? Is any of this groundbreaking information from the gospel? Probably not. So this is great. It's obviously the answer. Jesus is always the answer. But... Is it really as easy as we're making it seem today? And so I've been preaching to myself on our Friday night Vespers programs for a few weeks now. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to bring some of those messages into this message because I think the Lord really put it on my heart uh, on purpose. So we're going to spend some time in the book of, uh, of, Habakkuk, of Habakkuk today. And I mentioned last night, I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce that word, but let's call it Habakkuk because that seems to be well accepted amongst our people. The prophet Habakkuk wrote a three chapter book that is uh, nestled toward the end of the Old Testament. And it's not a book that we spend a lot of time in. So I'm going to operate with the assumption that you're not very familiar with the book and apologize if you are, but let's kind of walk through it and get an understanding of what this book is about. The prophet is upset. In a general sense, things are not going the way that they should in his estimation. We'll pick it up in chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. 
He's upset. He says, oh, Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry out to you violence and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble for plundering and violence are before me? There is strife and contention arises. Therefore, the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. Everything's wrong in his world. He says, there's no justice. There is no peace. There is no upright behavior. There is nothing good. Everything is wrong. And I'm crying out to you to do something and you're not. Why not, God? How long are you going to be silent and let this mess be before me? And then God actually agrees. That is a proper assessment of what is going on. Verses 9 and 10. God says, they all come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like sand. They scoff at kings and princes are scorned by them. They deride every stronghold for they heap up earthen mounds and seize it. So, man, I mean, if you're unhappy with the world and then you seek after God and he agrees with you, you know it's got to be pretty bad. So Habakkuk gets kind of angry at God that God now agrees with the prophet's assessment and is still doing nothing about it. So he gets angry, kind of like Job got angry at God toward the end of that book. And so in verse 13, the prophet is kind of I, I, I don't want to be I don't want to speak out of turn here but he's angry at God and he is speaking directly to God and says God you are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look upon wickedness why then do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he hmm Why, why, why? I'm going to use the election as the illustration for all of this because that's just the one thing that's both kind of most recent and also will hopefully resolve the soonest, right? But why, why, why are these the men from whom we have to choose to be the president? Why, God, will you pick this loudmouth who everybody hates to want to be president again. Why, God, will you pick this other guy who can't string a sentence together to lead the free world? Why, God, is this what you have chosen? There are no good answers here. Why is there a potential for another Donald Trump presidency? Why is there a potential for a Joe Biden presidency? Why, God, this doesn't make any sense. And so the prophet sets his mind on Jesus, so to speak, even though he would not have known that name. We have also decided to set our hearts upon Jesus, right? When the kingdoms of the world offer us nothing, we don't have a choice except to go to the kingdom of God and find refuge there. But Habakkuk gives us some insight into this, some real-life insight into maybe how not straightforward this process might be. So in chapter 2, verse 1, the prophet says, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he, meaning God, will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Okay? So uh, let's take this apart. This is a really profound verse here. On the one hand, Habakkuk has strong faith. He says, I have petitioned God for an answer. I believe he's going to give me an answer. Therefore, I don't just believe it in my heart. I'm going to set myself up in a place where I am definitely going to hear what he says. I'm going to go up on the rampart. That's like a, a, a raised area. I'm going to get close to God. I'm going to stand there like a watchman watching for God's answer so that when it comes, I will receive it. I'm going to watch to see what God will say to me. Let's all be that diligent. Amen? When we want an answer from God, let's take that seriously. Let's believe it by faith 
And then let's have the ears to hear the mind to understand what God's answer truly is. And then Habakkuk has such wonderful, lovely insight at the end of this verse. So he believes God is going to answer, but he also seems to understand that God's answer is going to be different than what he wants the answer to be. And so when that answer comes, it will be in the form of a correction to Habakkuk's preconceived notions. That's humility, isn't it? What if, I'm going to, some suppositions here, right? For the sake of this illustration, you were hoping Donald Trump would win, but then you woke up this morning and now Joe Biden's going to win. And you've been praying for the thing you wanted, but it looks like reality is going in a different direction. That's a correction, isn't it? Doesn't necessarily mean that God got it wrong. God never gets anything wrong. It also doesn't mean that he was unfaithful to your prayer. It means you were praying the wrong thing. And so the answer comes as a correction. And Habakkuk is really open to that. He's expecting a different answer than what he wants to hear. It will be a correction. Do you understand? We are fallen human beings. We do not have the insight that God has. Beware the person whose image of God is exactly what he wants God to be. Okay? Much more honest to expect a correction from God rather than a high five. So God's answer is not what Habakkuk was hoping for. Here is a sampling of, his, of God's answer just so you get kind of a broad picture of it. Chapter 2, verse 9. Woe to him! Verse 12, woe to him. Verse 15, woe to him. Verse 19, woe to him. Now, all these are different woes. Like, for example, this one, woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pressing him to your bottle, even to make him drunk that you may look upon his nakedness. I mean, this is like sexual assault, you know? So, woe to him who takes advantage of his neighbor this way. Woe to him who is... Um, corrupted by riches uh, while operating with supposed authority. Woe, 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 woe to all of these different people in all of these different situations. The answer from God is not a good one. God is not coming to say, hey, don't worry, Habakkuk. It's all going to be okay. Quite the opposite. God is showing up to say, actually, it is just as bad as you think, and it's going to get worse. And woe to everybody who's making it worse. But then, at the very end of chapter 2, after God has pronounced all of this judgment, he turns to the prophet and he says, verse 20, But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. There's a song in our hymnal based on this verse. See, God says, There is trouble. And in order to resolve this trouble, more trouble is coming. And woe to all of you who find yourselves on the wrong side of the resolution. But is the advice to the prophet to panic about it? No. Get upset about it? No. Do anything at all really about it? No. The word is keep silence. I'm in control. I'm in my holy temple. This is my plan. You, be humble. Be quiet. Let me be God. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let the earth keep silence before him. <sighs> I want to just linger on that point before I move on. Often, when we are confronted with an answer from God or even the need to get an answer from God, if we are confronted with an outcome from God that is not what we want, whenever we're trying to align ourselves with God, what is the natural human reaction? 
We try to do stuff, don't we? I need to get closer to God. I better go to church today. I got to be more faithful. I got to give a better tithe. You know, I need to get healthier. I better eat vegetarian. You know, whatever it may be, you try to like do things to align yourselves with God. And I think this verse really stands as a rebuke to that entire mentality. The Lord says, hey man, I'm working. I'm doing my thing. You be quiet. You're not God. I'm God. You be quiet. And this was the prophet's entire job. He was not supposed to run around doing stuff. It was the opposite. Go sit down. Be quiet. Let me be God. I would delight if the church would follow this example <laughs> and let God be God. So Habakkuk gets his answer, and eventually so will we. I mean, maybe the answer came this morning. Maybe we know who the next president will be. I'm skeptical. The current president doesn't seem to know how to stop fighting, even when it's in his best interest. So I kind of think it's going to be dramatic until the end. But I might be wrong. I'm not a prophet. Eventually, we will know the outcome, the final outcome, right? We will get an answer. Someone will win. Or maybe not. <laughs> maybe we're going to war. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. But we will find out the end result eventually. And we'll be in that position of Habakkuk. Whatever the outcome will be, I'm reasonably confident, whether you want Mr. Biden to be president or not, whatever the outcome is will not be what we want or expect. Even if the guy we want wins, the actual outcome will not be what we think it's going to be. Whatever comes from God is hardly ever what we really think it's going to be. So. What happens when we realize that? When we realize that reality is very different from our hopes, very different from the object of our prayers, very different than what we thought it was going to be, and that we're uncomfortable, even if we thought we would be comfortable. Reality is that we're actually not. What do we do? Chapter 3, verse 2, the beginning part of... Verse 2, look how, look how Habakkuk responds to the answer he gets from God. He says, oh Lord, I have heard your speech and I was afraid. Now think about that. Habakkuk's complaint was that everything was wrong. God showed up and said, hey man, you're right, everything is wrong. <laughs> you would think that would be kind of, in a certain way, what the prophet would want to hear. But it actually makes him afraid. Oh, Lord, I heard what you said. I'm scared. I don't want that to be your answer. I don't want to live in the outpouring of your answer. I'm afraid. But in his fear, he acknowledges God. Later on in his response, starting in verse 12, the prophet says, You, talking to God again, you marched through the land in indignation. You trampled the nations in anger. You went forth for the salvation of your people, your, for salvation with your anointed. You struck the head from the house of the wicked by laying bare from foundation to neck. Selah. Verse 14. You thrust through with his own arrows the head of his villages. They came out like a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was like feasting on the poor in secret. You walked through the sea with your horses through the heap of your great waters. See what he's saying here? All the nations, all the bad guys, they are everywhere. They're coming against me. But you, God... You walked through the sea. What does sea represent in prophecy? Come on, Adventists. People, right? Nations, languages, tongues. So the Lord shows up and just says, just clears them all away, parts them away, is walking through them like Moses through the Red Sea. The Lord is not subject to the chaos of earth. Habakkuk can be afraid. Doesn't stop what the Lord is doing. Habakkuk wanted an answer. He got it. He wanted an end to the injustice. 
he's going to get that too, right? The actual direct answer from God was, woe to you who do injustice. Woe to you who do injustice. Woe to you who do injustice. The vengeance of the Lord is coming. Habakkuk is acknowledging this in chapter 3 with all of this language, right? Thrust through with his own arrows, the head of the villages, right? So I'm coming at you with an arrow, and the Lord turns that bow around and shoots me in the head, <laughs> you know? So Habakkuk is getting an answer, but did he want the fullness of the outpouring of the vengeance of God? Probably not, you know? The vengeance of God is not something to trifle with. And maybe you want the badness to go away, but when you're confronted with God saying, oh, it's going to go away. Trust you me. It's going away. And you're like, whoa, whoa, that's, that's kind of more than what I was asking for, Lord. That scares me. So this is where he is. He's afraid. He is fearful. Verse 16 says that directly. When I heard, my body trembled. My lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered my bones and I trembled in myself. He is not happy with the answer from God, even though it was kind of what he was asking for. He is fearful. But how does this reaction turn around as a blessing for the prophet? The second half of this same verse. I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. Do you see those? I'm trembling. I'm scared. I'm being humble before God and recognizing his sovereignty. So that when the day comes of which I am afraid, I will have peace. I will be at rest. I've already wrestled with God about this. Now, when it actually comes, I rely on my Savior. I have rest while the whole world spirals into chaos. Do you think it felt like the entire world was spiraling into chaos when Babylon came? the first time? <laughs> Do you think it felt like chaos when Rome fell? Do you think it felt like chaos in 1798 in the days of the French Revolution? Of course. Anytime the status quo is upended, it feels like chaos. Absolutely. But God's people have perfect peace. We might have rest because we know that the Lord is in charge. Can there be peace with God amidst all of the devastation of his wrath? The prophet says, yes, there can be. Can there be peace with God in a Joe Biden presidency if we didn't want there to be a Joe Biden presidency? Can there be peace with God if Donald Trump contests all of this and embroils us in lawsuit after lawsuit or worse? I mean, we can't tell the future. Can there be peace with God day to day as the uncertainty continues? Sure, there can be. Verse 17. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. I mean, I, I seriously hope that no matter how this thing ends up, it's not going to result in our farms going barren and the lack of food, you know? I mean, who knows what will happen, but hopefully it's not going to be as bad as what's being described in this verse. And yet... The prophet says, I may not have food, <laughs> but I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Though all may fail us, friends, we can rejoice in the Lord. Verse 19, the Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high hills. So that perfect peace Look at how it manifests here. 
once he comes to that position of trust, once he comes to that position of rest, now the chaos doesn't matter anymore. Now it's just the prophet and God. God will bless me. Might be chaos over there, but the Lord is blessing me. Might be a riot over there, but I am blessed in my heart. Might be a civil war on the horizon, but the Lord is blessing me. You see, the chaos doesn't matter anymore when we have peace with God. And so to conclude this message, we'll go back to our scripture for today, which I found about 10 years ago. A good friend of mine uh, brought this scripture to me at just the right time in such a way that I have never forgotten it. Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Think about that for a moment. If you have to run somewhere to be safe, that means you're not safe outside of that area. So this is describing a world, a time, a situation where unless you run to God, there is no safety. Right? It's a time of chaos, of tumult, probably violence. But the Lord is a strong tower. And the righteous, even though the Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. From where do we get our righteousness, friends? It's Jesus Christ, the Lord, our righteousness. So the righteous is not me. It is Christ in me. The righteous run to that strong tower and it doesn't matter what's going on around that tower because I am safe. That's going to be my challenge to every one of you. We're living in troublesome times right now. Now, I don't know if this election or the fallout from the election have anything specific to do with end time events. I don't know. I can't see anything in prophecy about a election specifically, but you know, you never know. The Lord has all the pieces moving together at the same time. I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe a month from now, we've forgotten all about this and moved on with life. But regardless of what happens, we have a strong tower. We can stay there and be safe. We can be with God. We can have peace amidst a world with no peace right up until the very end if necessary right up through the rise of Babylon right up until the return of Jesus right through the thousand years when we're reading those books through the falling of fire from heaven that will devour the wicked all the way into that new world which we can behold as the Lord creates we can have perfect peace with God if we let him and if we don't, let the world interfere. So if you're willing to do that, friends, if you're willing to go to God to ask him to humble your heart so you can have that perfect peace like Habakkuk amidst a world that offers no peace, then pray with me now, please, as we seek the Lord together. <laughs> Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we are asking you to be our Savior today. Whether we are upset about the election results or not, whether we're upset about any of the causes of, um, of uncertainty that were mentioned or not, even if we're in peace right now, you know there's more coming that will disrupt that peace from an earthly point of view. And we are asking you to take up residence in our hearts right now so that it does not matter what comes. We can have that perfect peace with you. We can stay in that strong tower and be safe. And by your grace, we can endure until the end so we can meet you in the air and enter into eternity together as one family of God. Lord, do a miracle in our hearts as the world all around us is trying to disrupt that peace and set us against one another and against the world, as the devil is trying to disrupt the mission of this church and to set his people as enemies, set God's people as enemies. We need you to be our mighty king 
our mighty Savior, our mighty General, to go and conquer the foe of the devil, to conquer our hearts and subdue them, and Lord, to live in our hearts, in our place. Do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Send your Spirit to us, Lord, that we might be awakened and enlightened and we might do the work you have given us to do. Lord, come soon. Rescue us from this dark and chaotic world and give us eternity as you have promised. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.